Here we have a function which is the product of two square roots. And the question is, if we use the conventional choice of branch cuts for each of these square roots, what is then the branch cut of the overall function? So just pause the video to work on this. In one of the previous exercises, we've seen a different recipe to make this function single valued. And that's basically the following. We look at the arguments of our square root function, and then we look at the angle of that, that argument. And what we're going to do there is restrict that angle in the interval minus pi to plus pi. And that's a recipe to make the function single valued, uh, which coincides with the traditional choice of branch cut. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to look at the angles of the arguments of our square roots. Now the first argument is z minus one. So we're going to write that in polar form. So z minus one is going to be rho exponential uh, j theta. And then the second one, z plus one is going to be r exponential j phi. Okay, um, next step is trying to figure out where the branch points of this function are. Uh, draw them in a diagram and also figure out in that diagram where we will be able to read the angles theta and phi. So just pause to draw that, uh, that diagram. First of all, our branch points. So where do we have a branch point? If we look back at a simpler situation, just z to the power of one half, there the branch point is the origin as we've seen. Now, the origin is a situation where we no longer have any ambiguity with respect to the sign of the solution because plus one is the same as minus one. So this is where we have the, the start of our branch cuts in the branch points. Now, what will happen in this particular situation? So when do we have that the arguments of our two square roots here become zero so that the sign doesn't matter? That's obviously going to happen at the points minus one and plus one. So each of these factors will contribute one branch point, one over here and one over there. Next step is where do we find the angles theta and phi? So let's just draw our complex number z here. Now, if we draw a line from z to one, if you think about it, the length of that line is going to be rho. Why is that? Well, if you just look at the diagram here, if rho shrinks to zero, z will move on top of the point one. And that's exactly what happens in the formula as well. If rho becomes zero, then z minus one becomes zero or z becomes one. So that's, uh, that's consistent. And then the, the angle here, we can draw that over there. So this is theta. The only thing we've done basically here is just a shift of the origin of our coordinate system. If you draw a parallelogram over here, and if this is the point z minus one, um, then you clearly see that also this length is, is rho and this angle here is also theta. So the only thing we've, doing, we've been doing here is just shifting the origin of our coordinate system around. So now that we know where theta is located in the diagram, it's not a big deal to draw phi. So then we draw a line from z to minus one. In that case, we shift the origin here of our coordinate system to minus one, and this becomes phi. Good. So now what we need to do is we need to figure out how these angles evolve if we move around in the complex plane. And for that, we're going to look at a number of strategically located points, which I'm going to number here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And obviously these points are located either just above the real axis or just below the real axis. So we should look at them in a, in a sort of like limiting situation. So what I'd like you to do now is fill in a table for each of these points. So we have location one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, and eight. Figure out for each of these points what we should fill in for theta and phi. And then the final step in our recipe to calculate the result of our function is just adding these angles and dividing them by two. 
and that will allow us to figure out where we will have phase jumps, where we will pick up vectors of, uh, of minus one. So just pause the video to fill out this table and to try and identify where the branch cut is. Let's focus first on the angle theta. So the angle theta is what happens if we move around here and if we pivot around the point one. So let's first take a look at the points one and eight. Uh, they will be both equivalent and you will see that they have an angle of zero. So let's just fill that in here. That's an angle zero over there. Now we rotate until we're to the left of our point uh, minus of our point one. And then you see that points two, th uh, three and four, all of them are equivalent and they will all approach the arguments of pi if you keep on pushing closer and closer from the top to the negative real axis here. So this will always be an angle of pi here. Then for five, six and seven, well, what you shouldn't do is say, okay, this is just keep on pushing and then going to an angle which is slightly above pi, because that will keep bring us outside of the interval minus pi to plus pi. Rather, what you should do for the points uh, 5, 6, and 7 is say that they have an argument of minus pi, which will then keep on increasing when you rotate like this. So for 5, 6, and 7, we have an, interval, we have an argument of, uh, of minus pi. Okay. Um, so now that we know how to do this, it's very similar to look at the, the other angle here, but then we just pivot around the point minus one. And we clearly see that the six points on the right here, they all give rise to zero phase, so zero, 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 and zero. And then the only points that are non-zero are these points over there, which again have angles pi and minus pi pi over here and minus pi over there. Finally, let's do this very difficult calculation of adding and dividing by two. So that should give us something like this. And now we're finally able to figure out where the branch cut is. So to do that, let me just make a clear diagram over here, getting rid of some extra stuff. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So let's just take a walk in the complex plane and see when we encounter phase shifts. First thing to try is let's just cross the real axis over here from one to eight. Just looking in that table over here, you see that the phase doesn't change. It stays at zero. So here we certainly do not cross a branch cut because the phase just evolves uh, continuously. What happens over here if you move from four to five? Now, if you look in the, the diagram here, four and five, they will give different phases. You have pi over here and minus pi over there. Does that result in a different solution? Well, the answer is no, because the difference between these two phases is two pi. And if we stick within a certain plane if we keep adding two pi's or subtracting two pi's from the angles that does not make any difference so also here if we move from four to five we do not pick up any factor of minus one so a nice continuous evolution no branch cuts over there where do we do finally find the branch cut well what happens if we move from two to seven or from three to six if you uh, look at the diagram here, you will see that you move from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. In this case, that's a difference of pi. And a difference of pi is significant because that will give us the factor of minus 1. So if we move across this line over here, the solution does not evolve continuously. Rather, you have a, a jump in the sign. Um, so this is where our branch cut is located. And if you do not cross the branch cut, but if you just travel around happily like this, for example, in the complex plane, so from one, two, three, four, five, and then back to, to eight, you can easily verify that the phase keeps on evolving nicely continuously. So from zero over here, then we have pi over two, then we have uh, pi, and then we have minus pi, but that's the same thing. And then from minus pi, it keeps on increasing. So here you have continuous evolution, but as soon as you cross this line over there, 
you pick up a factor of, uh, of minus one. So this just shows you how to calculate the location of the, the branch cut in case you use the conventional choice of branch cut for the individual square roots. In case you want a little bit more detail about all of this, there's another exercise which uh, goes into different choices of branch cuts. Uh, so if you're interested in delving a little bit deeper in the wonderful world of branch cuts, have a look at uh, that other exercise.